Our second scripture reading is also from the New Testament, from the letter of James, chapter 1, verses 9 through 18. Again, listen to the word of God. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his holy word. Back in the 1960s, singer Peggy Lee had a top 40 hit with the song, Is That All There Is? Some of you may remember this song. In it, it tells the story of a girl who watches her childhood home go up in flames, and then later on is taken to enjoy a circus and then later on falls in love only to watch that relationship fall apart. And after each of these episodes in her life, which she thought would be amazing things or overwhelming things or incredible things, her reaction is, is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball, if that's all there is. And this cheerful song was nominated for a Grammy for Record of the Year. That's how popular it was. And I think it's because it captures an attitude that was then prevalent and is still prevalent in our society, a philosophy out of which we live to chase after things that the world tells us we need in order to be happy, to chase after things that the world tells us we should desire. We chase after fame, we chase after power, we chase after love, or at least sex. We chase after security, we chase after money, and then if we happen to gain these things that we chase after, these things that we invest so much of ourselves in acquiring, if we happen to get them, we find they don't make us nearly as happy as we thought they would. Or they make us happy, but it doesn't last. It's a temporary happiness. And then we ask, is that all there is? And so we're looking at a scripture today that addresses some of these issues, addresses some of these questions. It's from the book of James. If you've never read the letter of James, then let me tell you, he is not shy with his words. James lays it all out there on the line, and you will be hit squarely between the eyes on every single page of the letter of James. Here's what he has to say to us today. Let the lowly brother 
boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like the flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, the flower falls, the beauty perishes, so will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. So the issue here is wealth and the enormous pressure that we face today, whether you're rich or whether you're poor or whether you're middle class, to make your life all about wealth about accumulating more wealth, about investing wealth, about maintaining wealth. We are told over and over again subtly, and sometimes not so subtly, that this is what our lives should be about. We are told over and over again, we should be consumers. But that is our identity in this world. The world says whoever has the most stuff, whoever has the biggest bank account, whoever has the most toys wins at the game of life. I mean, think about how much of your life, how much of your energy, how much of your resources go into gaining and maintaining possessions. Think about if you have a vacation house, or if you have a camper, or if you have a boat, some big ticket item like that. Then you have to buy insurance on the vacation house, or the camper, or the boat. Then you have to set aside time out of your busy schedule to use the vacation house, or the camper, or the boat in order to justify having that thing. Then there's the costs and the time that goes into maintaining those things, repairing those things, upkeep for those things, pretty soon you are putting a lot of yourself, you are investing a lot of your resources into this thing. And that's not necessarily bad. It could be a thing that brings a great deal of joy into your life. It could be a thing that gives you an opportunity to invest in your family because we have this, we go together and get to spend time with each other and get to know each other better. It could be through that thing, you now have a ministry opportunity to make new relationships so that you can spread the love of Jesus Christ. Or it could be a vain, selfish pursuit. It could be a selfish endeavor. It could be a tremendous waste of time and resources. It all depends on the attitude we have toward that thing in our lives. And it can be very seductive sometimes. And the poor face the same pressures, the same questions, only the world tells those who are poor that they need to do whatever it takes, whether it's moral or not, to become the kind of people who have vacation homes and boats and campers and big ticket items like that. The world is telling each and every one of us, no matter where we are on the socioeconomic ladder, you should not be content. And you won't be content, the world says, until you get a new cell phone. That looks awfully old. <laughs> How can you be content with that old cell? There's a new version that's been released. You better run out and get in line and buy it. It's only $1,000. The world tells us, how can you be content with your old car? You need the new car with all kinds of bells and whistles that you'll never learn how to use. How can you be content wearing those old clothes or having that old haircut? There's new styles you need to run out and buy. How can you possibly be content without all of these things that we want to sell you? And this is all around us, folks. You may think that you are not drinking this in, but oh... It's everywhere. We are steeped in this culture. This is the culture that we are living in and we are hearing these messages every day. And James is saying to us, folks, in the church, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you need to be counter-cultural. You can't go along 
with these messages that the world is sending you. There's a different message that God is sending you. And if you are poor, James says, the message God is telling you is good news. Folks, your worth is not measured by your bank account balance. Your treasure in life is not in the things that you accumulate. The treasure that you have is in Jesus Christ, in His love, in the status that you have with Him, in the earthly, heavenly, excuse me, the heavenly treasures, the eternal treasures that He promises us when He returns and brings in the new heavens and the new earth. And to the rich, The message is the very same, but they may not hear it as good news necessarily. To the rich, he says, your riches are not in these earthly things that you have accumulated because those earthly things will not last. (coughs) Excuse me, tried not to cough into my microphone. You may have a million dollars in the bank. You may have multiple houses, multiple cars, multiple investments, but one day all of that is going to be gone. It's not going to last. Jesus says the very same thing. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, let me be sure to say something that I try and say every year when I preach on stewardship. It is no sin to be wealthy. It is not a bad thing or an evil thing to have possessions. And that's good because every single one of us here today, by the standards of the world and especially by the standards of history, we are enormously wealthy. I know you may not think of yourself that way. You may think of yourself as part of the lower class or part of the middle class, but by the standards of the world, the majority of people living today, and especially by the standards of history of those who have lived before us, we are incredibly rich. If you own a car, especially if you own more than one, you are fabulously wealthy. If you have money, that you don't need to spend to stay alive today, if you have a little dish of change even sitting on your dresser, you are fabulously wealthy because all throughout history and in many places around the world today, people are living day by day. And if they happen to get money that day, then they will eat that day, but they're not so sure about tomorrow. If you have a winter wardrobe and a summer wardrobe, you are wealthy. And there's no need to feel guilty about that. There's no need to be ashamed of that because James here even says every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. You have been incredibly blessed by God. Give thanks for those blessings. The question, though, that both James and Jesus are forcing us to ask are, what is my attitude toward these lavish blessings that God has given to me. Do I expect them? Do I feel entitled to them? Do I think I deserve them and more? Am I living my life to get more and more and more of these blessings, or am I a steward of these blessings? What are my blessings for? How am I using these blessings that God has given to me? And ultimately, what am I investing my life in? Am I investing my life in earthly things or in eternal things? Because both James and Jesus remind us here, the earthly things will not last. They are not eternal. If you invest yourself in these earthly things, ultimately you will come to the place where you will say, ah, 
is that all there is to life? I've gotten more and more and more, and I'm still not happy. You can amass a fabulous fortune. You can have an investment portfolio that would make Warren Buffett jealous. You could put together a whole harem of sexual partners. You could gain a fleet of cars and boats and planes and a wardrobe to die for. I promise you, you will not be content. You will be dissatisfied still. And one day, all those things will be gone forever, and that's the truth. So James is telling us here, your wealth, your possessions, they are a trial. That doesn't necessarily, I don't think he means that it's a burden to have these things, although it can be sometimes. I think he's saying we are on trial, that one day a verdict will be pronounced over each of us depending on how we have spent what God has given us in our lives, how we have invested those things. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Blessed is the one who remains steadfast under this trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Those who pass the trial of the treasure will receive blessings from God. Those who do not James just kind of leaves that out there. Fill it in in your mind. Blessed are the rich who don't make their lives about their riches. Blessed are the rich who remember that earthly riches are only temporary. And blessed are the poor who don't spend their lives chasing after these riches and don't become bitter because of their relative poverty. Blessed are those who invest themselves not in earthly treasures where moth and thief and rust can take them away from us. Blessed are those who invest in permanent, eternal treasures treasures. For if you invest your life in your business, and we've all met people who have, who pour every minute of their day, every ounce of their energy, every dollar of their resources into building their company, building their business, one day you're going to have to hand that business over to somebody else, your son, your daughter, your partner, And how many times have we seen the first generation build up the business only for it to pass to the next person who runs it into the ground? And there's your life's work gone. If you invest your life and your identity in gaining fame, popularity, notoriety, being known, in five years you could be forgotten forever. Back in 2015, Sir Paul McCartney, maybe some of you have heard that name, little British band made a splash called The Beatles. Heard of them? Sir Paul McCartney, back in 2015, did a collaboration with rapper Kanye West. And when the song hit, Twitter exploded with all kinds of tweets of people saying, isn't it great how Kanye gives opportunities to people who haven't made it yet in the music industry? Isn't it great how Kanye gives an opportunity? I bet this McCartney guy is really going to hit big now that Kanye has given him an opportunity. Folks, that's fame. It slips through your fingers. You could be known by everybody, and then the next generation, no one has any idea who you are. The stock market can crash, as we all know all too well. Land can be destroyed by a hurricane, by a sinkhole, by an earthquake, by a wildfire. At one time, we said that as a, oh yeah, it could happen. This year, all of those things have happened, haven't they? We've seen millions of acres destroyed. And James is saying that if you are using your money and your time and your energy and your possessions to make your name here on earth, if you are investing these things in trying to be secure here on the earth, if you are investing yourself in making yourself big here on the earth, then you are a fool then you are a fool. Because if nothing else, one day we're all going to die. 
And as the Spanish say, there are no pockets in shrouds. You can't take it with you. And God will not be impressed by the size of your bank account balance. God will not be impressed by the diversity of your investment portfolio. God will not be impressed by your collection of gadgets and toys. Nor will he be disdainful of you if you have none of these things. Instead, and this is both good news and a challenge for each and every one of us, we all are facing a test. How are you investing your life? God has given us all certain resources. He's given us time. He's given us wealth. He's given us talents. He's given us energy. How are we spending those things? In what are we investing those things? What are we using them for? What is our life about? One day, we're going to be called to account for that. And I want to say here, and if you hear nothing else, I want you to hear this. I want to say here that if you invest your time and your wealth and your talents and your energy in Jesus Christ, in knowing Jesus Christ, in loving Jesus Christ, in serving Jesus Christ, in blessing his church, in living the way that Jesus lived, in investing in people as he invested in people, especially the poor, the needy, the lonely, the grieving, the hurting, those who cannot take care of themselves, that is an investment that you will get a guaranteed return on. That is a rock-solid investment. You will gain treasures in heaven for investing your life that way. No moth or thief or rust will ever touch those investments. And where your treasure is, Jesus says, there your heart will be also. What you invest your earthly treasures in is an indicator to you of where your heart lies. So what are you investing your treasures in? What are you investing your life in? If you're not sure, may I suggest you look at two things. Look at your calendar and look at your bank account balance, your checkbook register. If you handed your calendar, your schedule, to a complete stranger, to someone who didn't know you, would they be able to tell by the way you spend your time that you are a follower of Jesus? Would it show to even an outsider that Jesus is your treasure, that Jesus is your number one priority in life? Would they see that you spend time in prayer, that you spend time in scripture, that you spend time in worship, that you spend time investing in other people, in blessing other people, in serving those in need? If you handed your bank account balance, your checkbook, to a complete stranger, someone who did not know you at all, would they be able to tell by the way you spend your money that Jesus Christ is your master, that he is number one? Are you investing in the church? Are you investing in other people who are in need? Are you investing in worthy causes? Moreover, when people look at your relationships, when they look at the way you interact with your family, with your friends, with your church family, with your coworkers, with your neighbors, does it show that Jesus is number one in your life? Do these people know the good news of Jesus Christ because of you? Do they see Jesus through you? In other words, is Jesus your master? Or is something else your master? Does your pledge card show that Jesus is your number one? Or does it tell another story instead? We're only ever going to have one master. We can't serve more than one. Jesus is very clear about that. Either we will use our time, our talents, our relationships, and our treasures to serve Jesus Christ, or we will try to get Jesus to serve us so that we get more time, more treasures, more, 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 more. And a lot of people are trying that experiment. If I get just enough Christianity, then maybe I can be healthy, wealthy, comfortable, and safe. Folks, it doesn't work that way. 
If you're living that way, trying to get Jesus to serve your needs, then again, you are foolish. If you live that way, you're going to end up singing, "Eh, if that's all there is, well, then let's just keep on dancing. And one day, we're all going to stand before the Lord, and we're going to give an account for how we have spent our lives, and we'll either get a return on our investment or we won't. Those who have invested in Him will receive the crown of life. Those who have invested in themselves and in the things of this earth will lose everything. So how are you investing your life? May we all have the wisdom to lay up our treasures in heaven. And to God alone be the glory. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the lavish blessings that you have given to each and every one of us. And we pray that you would give us wisdom and give us courage to lay up our treasures not here on earth, but in heaven with you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.